I want to read just briefly from Hebrews chapter 10 and then speak briefly before we share together in the Lord's Supper. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5. I'm just going to break into this sentence. When Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Well, Once again, as we do, as Jesus bids us do, that is, remember him until he comes, it's important always that we set the celebration of the ordinance, the symbolic meal itself, within the context of the Scriptures and what they reveal to us of Jesus. The the ignorance of people in relationship to Jesus extends to the very name of Christ. Uh, when you talk to people, they think that Jesus was essentially his first name and that Christ was his second name or his surname. And we need to teach our children and remind ourselves that the name Jesus was his personal name. It was the name that was given to him. And the name Christ or Messiah or Anointed One is indicative of of the ministry that he exercises. And in the Old Testament, there were three particular offices whereby the individual serving in that capacity was anointed for service, namely the office of the prophet who spoke the Word of God, the priest who offered sacrifices to God, and the king who executed his rule in the name of God. And so it is that when we follow those lines through the Old Testament, we discover why it is that Calvin, in the most helpful way, uh, determined to explain Christ by means of that threefold office. And so much of what he did in his theology was to explain Jesus in terms of him as prophet, priest, and king. Thomas Watson, in the most helpful book, A Body of Divinity, has a wonderful section beginning on page 166 and going to page 191, in which he covers the exact same material. And if you have never really thought this through, I commend it to you. The book is in the bookstore or can be purchased uh, by you on order. And I just want to remind us uh, of this as we come to the Lord's table tonight. First of all, uh, that that Jesus fulfills the role of prophet. Uh, In the book of Deuteronomy, the anticipation is that the Lord God will raise up uh, among them a prophet, and that that prophet will um, outdo all the prophets that that have gone before. And what it essentially reminds us of is this, that all that a man or a woman ever knows of God 
all that we ever know of God, does not come about as a result of deduction. It does not come about as a result of deductive reasoning, but it comes about as a result of God's self-disclosure, that God is a God who speaks. He has spoken his word. He has spoken through the prophets. And finally, Jesus does not simply convey the word. Jesus actually is the word. And Thomas Watson, in the book that I'm mentioning to you, uh, has a lovely little phrase where he says, he who is taught of Christ sees the arcana imperi, which, of course, you will remember from Latin at school, means sees the state secrets. Those who are taught of Christ see the state secrets. It ought to make us think of when Jesus says, I speak in parables that in order that they might hear but not understand, but to you I speak in such a way that you may both hear and understand. Why? Because they're being taught of Christ and they understand the secrets of the state. That's why the Bible also says that the natural man or men and women in our natural condition do not receive the things of the Spirit because they're foolishness to them. If I had a dollar for every time people say to me, and I don't understand why it is, because she's such an eminently sensible person. Why is it that she doesn't believe? Why is it that she doesn't see it? The answer is she can't. She can't. She can only see it by his self-disclosure. The natural man may be really clever, really brilliant as a scientist, a genius mathematically, and yet when you tell them about the Bible— It all just seems like a puzzle and a riddle to them. Why? Because these things are spiritually revealed. They remain that until the eyes of our understanding are opened and Jesus as prophet comes to do so. He teaches us externally in the Bible. He teaches us internally by the Spirit. And what a teacher Jesus proved to be. Remember, in uh, the Gospels, it says again and again that when the people heard him teach— remember, he said that um, uh, the, 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 there were two builders, and, and one built his house on the sand, and it fell flat, and another one built his house on the rock, and it stood firm when the winds beat upon the house. And, and everyone who hears these words of mine and, and puts them into practice, he says, will be like the man who built his house on a rock, and, uh, and it, will, it will remain— it will remain standing. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority. The prophet had come. Luke 24, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, when they finally reflect on what has happened, remember what they said? Didn't our hearts burn within us when he talked with us on the road and when he opened the Scriptures to us? Why? Because Jesus is the prophet who comes to deal with our ignorance in the revelation of himself. Secondly, Jesus is our priest, executing the office of a priest in that he has offered up himself as a sacrifice, and by that sacrifice satisfying God's divine justice, and by that sacrifice reconciling us to God. And as a result of that sufficient sacrifice, then ever living to make intercession for us. So he executes the office of a priest in a once-and-for-all sacrifice for sin that is in need of no repetition, and in continuing to intercede on behalf of those for whom he has made that sacrifice. And that's why he stands out, because Jesus stands on the stage of time as the priest who has accomplished all that the previous priests could only illustrate. The priests, as you know, had a variety of responsibilities. They were able to identify leprosy, and if it was cured, they could acknowledge that it was cured. That's why, remember, when Jesus healed the man who was leprous, he said, now go and show yourself to the priest according to the law of Moses, because the priest had the responsibility to say, yes, that's right, the person has been, cle- has been cleansed. So they could recognize it if it was present, or they could also recognize if it was absent— but they didn't have the power either to cleanse or to restore. And Jesus comes as the priest who cleanses us from our sins and restores us to a relationship with God. These priests brought sacrifices, but they were sacrifices, as we read in chapter 10, that couldn't take away sin. If they'd been able to take away sin, 
then they wouldn't need to be repeated. But they were repeated all the time because they couldn't accomplish what they symbolized. They were waiting for one sacrifice for all time, a sacrifice for sins. Uh, Isaac Watts, in that great hymn, which I daren't start quoting because I might not be able to finish it, but remember how it begins. At least I can get you started, and you can Google it from here. Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain. Could, could, could cleanse the guilty heart from sin or wash away its stain. But Christ, our Paschal Lamb, bears all our sins away, a sacrifice of something, something, a nobler name than they. So that when we take this cup tonight, we realize that it bears testimony to what we say when we sing another song, I need no other sacrifice, and I need no other plea, because it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. And where he has made this sacrifice for sins, and where there is forgiveness for sins, he says, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. And that is what we recall as we share in this tonight. He is the prophet who comes and deals with our ignorance by revealing himself as the living Word of God. He is the priest who achieves what all the other priests could only point forward to, and he is the king. He is the king, subduing us to himself by ruling us, defending us, and he executes his office as a king in restraining and conquering all of his enemies and all of our enemies. This King, Jesus, has the power to subdue us when we're rebellious, to set us free when we're all tangled up. And the story of the King's activity is sometimes a story which takes place dramatically and instantaneously, but not always so. Don't misunderstand me. The work of regeneration is a dramatic and instantaneous work, but the work of the king in subduing our enemies and in conquering our sins, let's be honest, has not happened in all of our lives instantaneously. It didn't happen in the life of Simon Peter instantaneously. Even after all he'd been through, he was still looking over his shoulder and trying to find out what was going to be happening to the Apostle John. You would have thought that by that time in his life, he would have realized that it doesn't really matter what's happening to the Apostle John. It's about him following Jesus. It was a hard job for him to figure all this stuff out. And some of us who have been dramatically set free from things tend to be rather less than patient with others who seem to be struggling as the work of the Spirit of God hammers away at the superstructure of our lives, turning this little cottage of our lives into a beautiful mansion that he intends. Now, this king is the one who seeks the welfare of his people and who speaks peace. And it is before this king we bow, and it is at the feet of the cross where his sacrifice as priest has been accomplished, that we come, and it is in our need of correction and direction that we come to him who is our prophet. And in that verse that was mentioned by one of the children, Hebrews 13, 6, the Lord is my helper. Why would I be afraid if anybody did anything to me? That's verse 6, and then it goes on in verse 8 to say that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And therefore, he executes this threefold office in a way that not only has significance in looking back, and not only significance in looking around, but significance also in looking forward. And those of us who've lived a long time had this burned into our recollection by singing it. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. All may change, 
but Jesus never. Glory to his name. And what is his name? He did not come to judge the world. He did not come to blame. He did not only come to seek. It was to save he came. And when we call him Savior, and when we call him Savior, and when we call him Savior, then we call him by his name. Just a thought in preparation for sharing in communion together. Father, look upon us as we prepare to break this bread and share this cup in the awareness of the wonder of your work in and through your Son, Jesus. And here we find ourselves on the evening of the first day of the week with so many things that press in upon us, seek to threaten and undo us, the accusations of the evil one, the disappointments of the past, the fears of tomorrow, so much. And in the midst of all of that, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes her sorrows, heals her wounds, and drives away her fear. May the sweetness of the name of Jesus fill our hearts in the dying embers of this day as we break bread together. For we ask it in his name. Amen.